Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome. Uh, and we have with us Jessica Tarlov, one of my favorite lefties. You're a Fox News <laughs> contributor. You're head of research at Bustle. Tell people what Bustle is. So Bustle Digital Group is a digital publisher. We have nine publications. Um, we just actually acquired probably most relevant and fun for your audience, Nylon. And we're going to be bringing back the Nylon's current... great. I know. We have good ones. We have yeah. Gawker, which will relaunch once oh, we dear. get that all under control. Okay. No, it'll be fine. There'll be no outings or sex tapes or anything like that. Um, so we have a big women's lifestyle collection and then a culture and innovation collection. And yeah, so I run the research team there and I'm at Fox the other half of my time. I think you are the best person I know at explaining leftist ideas to conservatives. <laughs> and I got to oh, tell you something you. else. A lot of people talk about you behind your back at Fox, and they all think you're great. So there's Oh, little, that's really nice. Which, But that is surprising because our country's gotten so polarized, <laughs> yeah. right? Can you explain why it is? Like, what is your trick to talking to people on the right without them thinking? I, some of them do think you're a commie, but that you come off as reasonable at the very least. Um, I think that putting in the work makes a lot of difference. I think that too often when people are on opposite opposite sides of the political spectrum, they kind of just, you know, shoot their mouths off and say like, well, this is just sort of the way it is, or like, it's the law, kind of and like, get out of my face. But actually unpacking why it is you feel that way and circumstantially how you arrived at that conclusion, I think makes a big difference. Um, one thing that I've talked about actually in – I do this presentation about my work at Bustle and at Fox about modern female voices in media because I, I think that there is a difference in the way that you communicate as sure. a woman. And um, one thing that I really harp on is how important it is to say, I totally take your point or I understand where you're coming from. And especially when you're dealing with people on the right, religion is often such a key yes. component of what's going on that you have to be – very sensitive to that. And I think that that's something that I've been able to do that has endeared people on the right to me where they say, I don't agree with anything that you're saying, but at least you're not insulting my way of life. Because you, you can't fight with someone's religion, right? Sure. Like it's just, that's what makes the abortion debate so terrible. Because when you're sitting next to someone that's saying, no, it's this way, and you realize it's grounded in their faith that has been hammered into them since they were a baby, what are you going to do? Or a fetus. <laughs> no, they were out. <laughs> Not Ralph Northam style. They were like, you know. Yeah, explain this to me because <laughs> I have – when I watched Ralph Northam make those comments, which I found – I considered myself pro-choice. And now I'm kind of on the fence because I don't think if a woman is pregnant eight months that she can just go in some place. Well, she can't. Okay. But what I'm saying is like I don't know if that makes me pro-life or pro – but the thing is Ralph Northam, the way he was describing for those who remember, he was governor of Virginia. And he was basically matter-of-factly talking about if a, a birth is – and please correct – I'm going to – yeah. Give you my perception, then you'll give me the correct perception, right. please. That basically in certain cir circumstances, the woman is either gives birth or is induced to give birth. And if the child has no chance of survival, they basically let the kid die or or or, or yeah. uh, something like that. The, what I found uh, troubling is he was very matter of fact about what is, I'm sure, a very rare situation, but also Super a very uh, extremely disturbing situation. Yeah. So can you tell me how it was perceived and... I'm, I'm assuming you're very pro-choice. Yeah. Uh, how the pro-life people framed it from your perspective incorrectly. So I was surprised and disappointed by the way that Governor Northam spoke about it because he's also a doctor, right? There are a lot of people who are in positions of political power who don't know better and don't know the right terms and the ways to be talking about it. He's definitely been versed in this. He, I mean, he's run in a state that used to be more conservative as an open pro-choice advocate. So you should know better. And when I heard it, I cringed too because I could understand how people heard the baby is born and then you kill it, essentially, right. which is not the case. So he should have talked about, first and foremost, the viability of the fetus, that it would never – live on its own okay. and that it was already, you know, halfway to perishing, 
essentially. Um, And he didn't also talk about the horrors of this experience, which I think is some of the most effective advocacy for pro-choice policies is around how difficult these decisions are and which is the core of why you want it to be safe, legal, and rare, right? Which is what the Democratic Party says about abortion. So I completely understand feeling like really icky about it. Um, but but he you're al- just doing what, what you just said you're going to do. I get what? your point. Yeah. No, but I <laughs> actually... Just, you actually just did it. Okay, good work. I, I've won. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it was something that actually affected even pro-choice advocates through the end of the third trimester because that only happens when someone's not going to live, right? Either the fetus is not going to live or the mother's not going to live. And you can't find doctors who will perform this just for the hell of it. And what the right wing did with it, and I know this because I sat next to many of my colleagues that were saying absolutely fantastical nut stuff that, and even President Trump has said it, that, you know, that's the party of killing babies, right? Like they have a baby, it's out, and then they're just like, nah, I don't want this. That's not what's going on here. And we can certainly debate which party has better adoption policies and entitlement programs for people who do end up having a child that they didn't necessarily want or have the means to care for. So that's my take on the Northern comments. I think it set us back dramatically. It made things very difficult for organizations like Planned Parenthood. And there was a big controversy last year. You know, the president of Planned Parenthood actually quit over this. She's a doctor um, and quit over the politicization, essentially, of what part of what Planned Parenthood does, which is obviously they're an abortion provider, but they're first and foremost a healthcare provider. And she actually parted ways with them over this. And I I think Northam's comments, not only living in infamy in commercials, I'm sure we'll be seeing this during the presidential, right? Especially now that Joe Biden has shifted, if he's going to be the nominee, which I believe he is, um, has shifted his stance on the Hyde Amendment. Um, it, it's going to come back, and I, and I do, not just because it's an effective tool. I, I do understand your point on it. It was not well articulated, and when you're talking about abortion, you have to be really freaking careful. You really shouldn't use the word inarticulate about a, a governor who's black. <laughs> he's only black when Michael Jackson's on or he's on a cruise ship. Uh, or was that one of the other ones? Can you can you believe that all of those guys in Virginia still have their jobs? Like all of them. But I mean, that that's the conservative point of view, right? That don't this is like a complete double standard. Yeah, I I thought Northam should go, frankly, okay. but he only had a year left. I think that was the idea. Like, if I can ride this out and go on some sort of, like, I understand you black people tour, it's going to be fine. And he had no history of racism in him, though we still don't know if he was in blackface or the hood. Right. And I I think he was in the hood. Yeah, that, that I, well, right? yes. Right? Because that, that's the thing you would want to say even less. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, but can you explain the New York state law? Because that was another one that pro-life people jumped on. When was, we lit up the Empire State Building pink, that was another thing they were freaking oh, out okay. about. Well, Cuomo that, did that, it to celebrate. That's different. But the, 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 there's a recent law that basically... Oh, no, in honor of this law passing. That's okay. why he did yeah. it. Um, so it was portrayed... Yeah. Uh, on Twitter and elsewhere mm-hmm. that basically a woman in New York State can, with her doctor's permission, get an abortion up until nine months of pregnancy. Is that incorrect? It is incorrect insofar as it, they will not perform that abortion because you just feel like having one. There okay. has to be medical grounds. The problem that people had with it is that there could also be psychiatric grounds for it. So it gets into more of a gray area. So it's not just life or health of the mother or life or health of the soon-to-be baby. It got into... Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to stop you because when you're saying soon-to-be baby, if it's nine months along and this... this... It's viable outside, barring some cataclysm, you know, if they have the umbilical cord around its neck. But I'm just saying that the terminology is to not call it a baby until it's out. But don't you think that's disingenuous? Listen. No, you listen. (laughs) I feel like I'm like Joe Biden. I'm like, let me tell you folks. Um, I don't think that it's disingenuous because I think the distinctions are important for the general conversation. But I do understand why people are uncomfortable with a third trimester abortion. If about 20, 24 weeks, let's say, depending on it, is the viability threshold. Um, And Hillary Clinton has actually spoken about how she does understand those laws that are saying, okay, past this point where the baby can survive outside of the mother's womb we should be looking into tighter restrictions on abortion. Um, and, but nine months, yeah, that's why it doesn't really happen. And that's the issue, I think, this okay. amplifi- amplification of a myth that people are doing this all the time. 
they aren't doing it all the time. And it's also a huge physical toll on the mother to do something like that. Um, so, what do we, how is it a huge physical toll? I don't understand. Well, if you're having an abortion at that point, it's not like, you know, oh, I hooked up with a guy three nights ago and I've got to, sure. you know, it's a big thing that either you have to give birth in some way or, I mean, there's like, they give you drugs so that it, is taken care of inside of you, but it still has to get out of you. Yeah. And, you know, you've there's 35 to 40 pounds worth of fetus and stuff inside of you that has to come out. And it's just, it's a huge, it's a gruesome, terrible but I, thing. I, I, I mean, the reason I'm going in the pro-life direction is because as you're describing this, you're trying to use words that aren't organic because you want to say give birth you want to say baby because i mean at that point it really is i i don't understand any i i, I don't un can, please i want to understand your point of view better because i'm a new yorker all my life i don't understand the reticence other than propaganda reasons for when it's eight months along to not call it a baby i do in my normal okay like if we were, if this wasn't water and it was a cocktail, I would definitely say that. And I, I'm willing to admit, I mean, people who are close to me, you know, I have lots of friends who have kids. Once they were pregnant, we started talking about their baby. Yeah. Right? Sure. When we named it and we did all, you know, how did you have a checkup? Like, can you see the baby's feet? Can you see, you know, yeah. what's going on? And I think that that is important in human interaction and that we do all accept that. And, for you to say I'm moving in the pro-life direction, I think that there should be a distinction. Like I said, I understand people who are pro-choice first and second trimester, and once you get to a third trimester, unless there's something like a survival issue that yeah. is imminent for either party right. involved, the mother or the baby, yes. I'll give it to you. Um, I understand people who aren't for that. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard isn't, right? So she's against third trimester abortions. I think she was the only candidate that that was her official policy. Um, but the difficulty in terms of moving your political position on this is that there are these extenuating circumstances. And if you start restricting them, you are endangering people's lives. And, you know, we are privileged to live in New York State sure. in terms of what – kind of care we're getting and what is available to us. I mean, there's, you know, the original Planned Parenthood is sitting there on Bleecker Street, and it's always a resource for someone like me. Um, but I have always really taken to heart that I should be voting not on behalf of myself and my priorities, but the person who is going to be the most affected by them. So I think about, you know, single mothers in rural Texas who have had every women's health clinic around them shut down and Republicans say, oh, no, we'll replace Planned Parenthoods with, with another clinic. But they don't do that. They're not popping up. There are, I think it's a third of the counties in rural areas don't have a women's health facility. That's not fair. Obviously, it's discriminatory. It penalizes p women of color and low-income folks. And so I think when you get into a world where you're restricting things on a legal basis that you end up harming those people who are not going in for an abortion at eight months for the hell of it. It's not like, oh, it's Tuesday. I have nothing to do. These are harrowing, difficult decisions that they have to make. And so that's my concern. Yeah. At the same time, and I agree with, with what you're saying, but the, I hear what your point, but... Um, oh, don't worry. You don't have to be nice to me. I'm just, that's just how I survive at Fox. I, I am being nice <laughs> to you because I like you. Yeah. Um, at the same time, like there's things like, let's talk about uh, Telsey. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that she got a fair shake in this process? I do, actually. I think, well, she got a lot of airtime. Sure. Uh, so that, that complaint flies out the window to me. You know, if you can, Tucker essentially gave her an open entrance, right? I mean, she'd have the most watched, I guess Sean is, but, you know, sure. she could be on the APM show. I think she's been on with Sean, too. I mean, and it's not like it was only him. She goes on with Neil Cavuto, um, got got a lot of airtime. I think there was a lot of discussion, actually, of her campaign. She was more so than a Bernie Sanders, I feel like, advocating for that non-interventionist yes. perspective. And because she's actually a veteran, it makes a huge difference in the contrast with Pete Buttigieg, especially because they were the only two veterans running. Um, I do think that she got a fair shake. And I'm this last week has been very tough for me as someone who is, you know, quote, an establishment Democrat, because people have been making this argument that they did again in 2016, like, oh, we're rigging it against the outsider or whatever it is. People who are ideologically aligned coming together to stop an outcome 
that is not good for the party at the top of the ticket and also down ballot and doesn't match our political preferences is not the establishment ganging up on an outsider. It's normal for people to group themselves. And as far as the debate restrictions, because I think that's her latest qualm that that they took away because she had a couple delegates from American Samoa and should have qualified, but they changed the rules. You know, I can understand that argument, and I was very upset when, like, Cory Booker and Julian Castro got restricted from the debates, but Mike Bloomberg was suddenly Allowed. in, yeah, yeah. though it was certainly better for the health of the Democratic Party that people saw that he was a terrible debater. A um, terrible person. You know, so I used to work for Doug Schoen, who's his pollster, okay. oh, wow. and um, did his super PAC polling for years on gun control and soda bans and healthcare initiatives and for charter schools and, and things that have bipartisan support, actually. And I think he was a tremendous mayor. Um, But I was really concerned about ceding moral high ground to Republicans by having him as the nominee. Because if it's Trump versus Bloomberg, and you can run side by side ads that have Trump saying, like, what do you got to lose? And like, the Central Park Five is guilty. And then on our side, suddenly we have like, you know, stop and frisk saved lives and just throw them up against the wall. They all look the same or whatever it was that he was saying about young black and brown men in New York. That's not good. You don't, you know, NDAs, those kinds of things. Well, also the idea that, like, uh, in terms of the perception being that the DNC is corrupt and and basically forced Hillary through in 2016, then you have this billionaire who has never been elected as a Democrat, Rudy Giuliani's protege. He skips Iowa, skips New Hampshire, and he waltzes in and buys the nomination. The optics of that are deranged. They were not great for sure, but he also had – you can't – it's not a standard billionaire walking in and doing this because he does have genuine – bona fides on the Democratic side from getting all of these Democrats elected. I mean, those endorsements that came from people like Max Rose in Staten Island and Lucy McBath in Georgia, those were earned because of his advocacy for causes that matter to Democrats, from climate to gun control. Lucy McBath lost her son um, to gun violence. And it's tough. It's a double-edged sword. And I I don't – I am – breathing a sigh of relief that this is not a challenge we need to face. Because on the one hand, I think that Trump feared him the most because money is all that matters to him. And no way you can argue that Trump's a better businessman than Michael Bloomberg. Even if you give him the three or four billion dollars that he says that he has, Bloomberg has 63 and one of the most recognizable companies yeah. in the entire world. Um, so I liked that element of it. I thought, oh, great. He's going to be genuinely scared of somebody. Um, but I I thought it would be a very difficult road, and we would never have gotten the Bernie folks back with yes. Bloomberg. Just, I think, like, none of them. Yeah. Uh, do you think that Trump is scared of Joe Biden? It's hard to guess what's in someone's mind, I understand. Especially that mind. Yes, which correct. Which is the, of the most crooked nature. Um, Second one. So, <laughs> so yes and no. I think that the fact that he pressured Ukraine to look into him – indicates that he is to some degree because I think he's smart enough to know that Joe Biden's uh, character and policy platform would yield the most cross-party results in favor of the Democratic candidate. Like he can get moderate Republicans and independents. And so I think in that sense he is, but I also think he's just one of the more arrogant human beings that is out there. Uh, no, 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 Trump. Trump. Oh, yeah, of course, And just yes. thinks he can beat anybody, yeah. and that isn't it. And I think because of his own experience as an outsider that came in and blew up the system and got elected, I think he was also not assuming that Bernie Sanders would be a cakewalk. Oh, I, I no way he thought that. He right, well, but that. I mean, that's, you know, the messaging from the right is, oh, it would be a dream if it's capitalism versus no, it socialism. No, it wouldn't at all. Because it's inspiring. This is going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity for the hard left to get one of their own. They're going to turn out. They're going to mobilize. But what do you, but then we lose African American voters. Yeah. I mean, there's, that's the problem that we're facing right now sure. that I'm concerned about is we're trading, right? No matter what we do here at this point, especially the way that Bernie's diehards operate, there's a big concern. All right, let me interrupt you for a second. Who is your one favorite Republican? Hard to decide. There are so many great options. I would (laughs) say when I listen to – so actually, I'm going to split vote here. So before Justin Amash went independent, I would have said him. I love how he explains every decision in great detail. You can disagree with it, but it's there. And I really like Mike Lee. 
I the find Center him very Utah. charming. Yeah. He's very, very right And he was the only person, well, libertarian right wing. Sure. But he was one of only two Republicans that actually put up a real health care plan, which I thought if you're going to run around town saying we're going to abolish Obamacare, maybe you should have a suggestion as to what you're going to do after I that. I was on Glenn Beck's show a couple of weeks ago, and I said to him, "You, the Republic, it's you can't. And if someone says to you, Americans shouldn't go bankrupt if they get cancer, you can't reply with repeal and replace, except we're not going to do that. Except no replace. Yeah, th- uh, there's not. And an that's answer. why you, they lose elections. Yeah. And it's amazing that they don't learn that lesson because we tell them, like, we're going to run on health care. Yeah. And then they say, oh, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, Michael Malice here. want to tell you about Vessi. The smartest sponsors are the ones who send us stuff to try because then I can speak from experience. Vessi are... waterproof, weatherproof knit sneakers made of Dymatex, which is a dual climate knit material. It regulates the temperature warm in the winter, lets you, lets heat escape in the summer. It's very stretchy. They sent me a pair. I got the weird ones, which are the burgundy and cream. They've got the basic ones. They've, if you go to vessifootwear.com slash welcome, you get $25 off your order, 25 bucks off. These are my gym socks, gym sneakers now. What I love about Vessi is they're unusual enough that they look cool, but not so unusual that people are like, what are you wearing? That's the exact sweet spot to look hip in my view. Or you want to look like a weirdo like I do, you can go to the extreme ones. If you go to vessifootwear.com slash welcome and use code welcome at the checkout, you get 25 bucks off. It's patented. It's vegan. It has a grip for all weather. And let's get back to the show. Do you, do you, uh, do you, I think Hillary Clinton was by virtually every metric a stronger candidate than Joe Biden. 100%. So I would think that if Biden is the nominee, you would be panicking or very scared. So I'm scared anyway. So I think Trump is going to win. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not silly about the economy. And what's going on, obviously, pandemic aside, and I think Corona could throw a big wrench in this entire thing. And I think it's been very poorly handled up until this point. And, you know, if we were in a world where we could go and get a test kit any moment, that would be very different. But when you have, you know, hundreds of people on a cruise ship off of San Francisco and no 19 people can get a test, you know, that's a problem. Um, But I do think Trump is going to win re-election, I think. The economy is humming along. I think the fact that his approval rating, even when he gets impeached or, you know, we strike Iran and people are concerned, are we going to World War Three and all of this? And his approval rating doesn't move or ticks up a couple points shows that something is happening that someone who feels the way that I do politically just doesn't understand, Yeah, you know. And um, so that's my baseline going into all of this. And I do have concerns about Joe Biden, not who he is as a person and not his policies. That's completely up my alley and his competence to do the job. But everybody is too old. Like Trump is too old. (laughs) Biden's too old. Sanders is too old. And I do have concerns about that. You know, I don't think that I think more of what goes on with Joe Biden is his stutter than people are willing to acknowledge. He said he was running for Senate. But that that is he was repeating what he has been saying his whole career. That that one actually Wait, I'm on. not going to give to you. That's not how stutters work. It's oh no 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 no! But he was referring back to what he used to uh, say. So break it down for me because there was a clip okay. for those who don't know. Yeah. Where Joe Biden was in South Carolina and he says, "I'm asking for your vote where I come from. If you don't ask me for help, you don't get it." So I'm Joe Biden. I'm running for U.S. Senate. Consider me. If you don't like me, vote for the other guy. He had what he was referencing and had earlier in what he said was that this is has been his speech okay. that he gave when he was running for Senate. So that clip was taken out of context completely. That's like a great example. Thank you. Of, I'm glad to clarify that because right. this was brought up on when I was on Glenn Beck's show and I said, is he making a joke in reference to that's the speech you give yeah, the senator? Exactly. And he had been. OK. Yes. So in that particular instance. But that doesn't mean that there aren't complete, you know mind breakdowns yeah. that happen. He had- uh, His eye filled with blood. That's not a stutter. No, that's not a stutter. But the stuttering thing does exist. Um, yeah, there's a mental acuity issue. And that's why I think filling up as big of a picture of what your administration will look like is going to be critical for Biden. Like, 
if he gets – so by next Tuesday, he could have an insurmountable delegate lead. And it's certainly trending in that direction. And I think the faster he gets – a VP and says things like Pete Buttigieg is going to be Secretary of Defense, Amy Klobuchar is going to, you know, whatever it is that she might want. If whatever she's been promised, a hundred. That's yeah. how politics work. Yeah, of course. Right. And I read something really interesting um, from Ezra Klein, who's more liberal than Biden G- supporter. A jihadi without testosterone. <laughs> um, he said that what Biden was able to accomplish that weekend between South Carolina That's and Monday Tuesday, night. Yeah. No, not electorally necessarily, but getting Pete and Amy to Dallas to have two separate endorsement events speaks to what he promises on the campaign trail all the time, which is he can get things done. He can negotiate with people. He's a unity figure. And I thought that that was a really smart point. Obviously, Obama made phone calls too to both Amy and Pete. And Oh, is that the case? Yeah. Okay. And, and I mean, I wasn't on the phone, but, no, but yes, I mean, that's the case. I, I had tweeted out that obviously someone called them and said, yeah, this "Someone is what you very have to do. powerful." Okay, I, okay, yeah. And also, you saw Susan Rice yes. endorse. I did not see that. Yes, I saw Beto. Okay. That was yeah, Beto did. Um, but Susan Rice was the real clear sign that okay. Obama did. If it was this. Susan Rice, then and that's a good um, one. Yeah. Samantha Powers. Okay, okay, got it. So these are people who are obviously Obama Biden administration folks that had sat on the sideline, and I think right now in Democratic politics. There are three kingmakers, Nancy Pelosi, that can get anything she wants done. I mean, all this talk about the squad dominates this. Not true. And I think every honest Republican now acknowledges that, that she's really whatever the squad gets to do. She has said, okay, essentially, go ahead with this. Approved. Um, Approved. President Obama, who is like the puppet master of all of this. And then Jim, Jim Clyburn. The whip from South Carolina. You don't think Hillary has a, a inordinate power in the DNC to today's Democratic Party? Not at that level. Oh, I think, interesting. Okay. I mean, I'm, so I started her documentary last. The Hulu documentary came out, and you know what a big fan I am yes. of hers. Uh, is she still on your phone case? No, because I had to get a new phone. Though I still okay. have a home button, which apparently I should be embarrassed okay. about. But whatever. Um, and actually, Trump said it in one speech. Do you remember this? He was like, you know, with these new iPhones. Like, I like the home button. And I thought to myself, I'm like, oh my god, I agree with President Trump. What's the Trump. home button? You like the button you press. Like, I don't have Face ID okay. on my phone. Oh, like, okay. I'm yeah, way yeah. behind. Yeah. Um, but it's you know comfort. So she's not on my phone anymore because that case was custom for a smaller phone. But I still feel that way about her, and I certainly think looking at this field. That, as you brought up, she was the most qualified person, you know, and I, I don't like the comparisons of Warren to Hillary. I think Hillary was a much stronger candidate than Elizabeth Warren, um, especially with her foreign policy experience. Um, so I think that she does have a lot of power, but she can only go certain places. There are going to be districts, yeah. entire states where this is not going to help, even on the Democratic side. If you look at someone like Claire McCaskill... Who lost her seat in Missouri. I don't know how much seeing Hillary Clinton or any national figure, quite frankly, Nancy Pelosi knows she can't go certain places. If you remember in 2018 for the midterms, Pelosi told all of the Democrats running, do whatever you need to do. You need to bash me. You need to say you won't support me for speaker. Just get us the seats. And I think Hillary's in a very similar position. Now, what she has going for her is that she will, the Clintons are the most prolific fundraisers in Democratic history. And I don't think that that'll change. But I think as she continues to be demonized and continues to be talked about in the way that she has been, she loses national relevance and the ability to go into wherever and be a kingmaker for that. Like, I think you can drop Bill Clinton anywhere. And that that still works, despite the Me Too stuff, despite, you know, kind of, I don't want to say cognitive failures, but, you know, he fritzes sometimes, yeah, sure. too, and all of this. But I still think, for what everyone says about him, that people, even super woke feminists, would go gaga if they saw Bill Clinton. I don't think the same thing, unfortunately, is true of Hillary. Do you think Elizabeth Warren was lying when, it's impossible for us to know, we weren't there. The sexism thing? Yeah, when she, he, she report, there's two, there's two aspects to this. She had said that Bernie had told her, I don't think a woman can win the presidency. It was implied that he meant- Against I, Trump. I, or, or that a woman, I don't think a woman should win the presidency. It, yeah. it, it was made out that he was being a sexist as right. opposed to, listen, if someone is gay, Pete Buttigieg, I'm sure he asked himself, can a gay man get elected in America? That's a very fair question. Right. 
I I like that again, James Buchanan. <laughs> um, I I do think that she fudged that conversation, okay. or at the very least, she translated it the way that was going to best serve her purposes. And you know, it's not easy for me to defend Bernie. Um, I'm not a huge fan of his, but I believe that as people who have been so close for so long, he probably said something like, Lizzie, in this climate, I don't think a woman can win. And I think he's right. I If we were running against a normal Republican, like Mitt Romney, I think a woman could win. I do not think that a woman... Listen, if, so if uh, the Democrats put up Elizabeth Warren against Mitt Romney, by definition, a woman's going to win. <laughs> I like him. Yeah, though, of course you do. Yeah, right. Of course they do. Um, though he just voted to uh, see Hunter Biden's records. I mean, for all of the, I'm, you know, voting to convict. He's and- a snake. It's not like he's like a liberal Republican. He will st- he stabs people in the back for no purpose. Yeah. That's why he's the worst. Yeah, the Pierre Delecto thing I thought was funny. Though. Yeah, that was fair. Okay. Yeah, that was Twitter a good mo- a yes. moment for yeah. him. Even, you know, Trumpy Republicans admitted that. So I think that she fudged that. I think there was, and I, I have a piece coming out tomorrow in The Hill about this, actually, that people are being disingenuous in their postmortems about the Elizabeth Warren campaign. The truth is, is the media liked her more than Democrats did. Okay. Plain and simple. That's what was going on here. And her rise... In the polls over the summer, remember when she moved to like third or second nationally and first in Iowa, I think was completely driven by this glowing coverage because the media is putting aside Fox that obviously has more conservatives there. But the media is people like me. So white college educated liberal women or (laughs) liberal men who uh, identify as feminists and enjoy the nevertheless she persisted taglines and all of that. And people are looking at this huge breadth and depth of plans right she's got a plan for this she's got a plan for that it's so compelling she has huge energy the selfie lines which are not really selfies there i mean there was a lot that was tailor-made for a media class that has blinders on to what the country actually thinks and i've been harping on for months now how implicitly racist i think our primary and caucus system is because these narratives driven by iowa and new hampshire before basically a single black person yeah. has cast a vote and she was asked about this and she didn't yeah. she demurred, demurred. well it's a, it's a difficult uh, of one of course because cause you're running well because you're running and also in elizabeth warren's case versus bernie's she was showing up in the right places it just wasn't working and it's like you kind of have to take the L at a certain point, right? You've gone to enough black churches. You have gone to enough events and you have a diverse coalition of people working on your team and you're still not resonating. You got to go. And I think Amy and Pete also saw the writing on the wall that way. I think Pete obviously was more complicated because he was gay, that that was not going to because the African-Americans in this country are about 10, 11 percent less supportive of gay marriage than the general population. But that's really what I thought was going on with Warren. And I hate this sexism postmortem because I think that's really what happened with Hillary. When you look at how gendered all the conversation was about her, the likability issue, electability. But with Warren, she never had a broad coalition of support that gets you anywhere near the Democratic nomination. Do you know who I think would be the smartest VP pick for Biden? Who? Who's your answer? So right now, I either Kamala or Tammy Duckworth. It's Kristen Cinema. Oh, it's a good one. She is a kook, but I love her. She's a veteran. You yeah. get Arizona, which is like eight or nine electoral votes, uh, and you could flip it permanently, possibly like Virginia's kind of probably yeah. could flip permanently. Uh, the optics are great. You know, she's Aryan, uh, so it's. I, I think that we be lose great. the seat though. Possibly, but I mean, you. you well, because it'll get appointed by a Republican governor. Sure, but I yeah. mean, if, that, if the, you get the White House. You do get the White House, but that's, I mean, that level of- Tammy's also a great answer. Is, Tammy, that's a great thank answer. Thank you. That's, I, so I've been pushing that since her endorsement of Biden. So I've always loved her, and I think that she's just, she's ballsy, but reasonable about it. You know, she's not out there in the, like, impeach the MFR crowd, but is, she has, to use Kamala's terms, you know, we need someone who can prosecute the case. Tammy Duckworth prosecutes the case, right? The way that she speaks on the floor. Um, obviously, her veteran status helps a lot. She's a huge fan favorite of veteran groups. Um, but 
for women that are hankering to get a, have a woman they can get behind. I mean, to be the first sitting senator to give birth and nursing on the yeah. Senate floor, that's the kind of stuff dreams are made of for yes. us. And Trump will look like such a demon when he inevitably goes after this woman. And her kid. And her kid and all of it. I mean, just a woman in a wheelchair versus, you know, bone spurs. So it would be two people in wheelchairs against President Trump. <laughs> but who will be pushing Biden's wheelchair? <laughs> so his sister or his wife? So, and the thing is, every time we're going to hear, the, for months, people will be waiting to see if Biden calls her fuckworth by mistake. <laughs> so I, that's a very, very, very smart pick. Do you think, so this is something I've had an issue with. It's and also a, Illinois. Yeah. It's Pritzker can reappoint. Because yeah. that is a concern. Of Sher course. Especially with, so Sherrod Brown was my top pick for president for this time. I just think if you have someone who's carrying Ohio by six plus points at a time when it is essentially a blood red state at this point, you know, it's, people say it's a swing state. It's not a swing state anymore, except for Sherrod Brown. And he's an economic populist who's voted against every trade deal until the new NAFTA this time around. Yeah. Um, he has, quote, establishment bona fides. He's super pro-choice. You know, he's kind of got it all going. Um, and he didn't really want to win, uh, didn't really want to run, was how I heard it. So he, the night before he announced that he wasn't going to run for sure, I had he heard that he spoke with Joe Biden. And I imagine that's where his endorsement is going. But I think he would have been the best chance that we had. I think he's an easy Joe Biden endorse, endorser. That's another, oh, definitely. Another he question. just hasn't done it yeah, yet. Yeah. Um, not out of any allegiance, I think, to Bernie Sanders, but just to stand the sidelines for it. All right. Let me interrupt you for a second. Who is your one favorite Republican? Mitt Romney is my favorite Republican. I think he displays some degree of morality and ethics. Obviously, his vote to convict Trump um, in the impeachment uh, mattered a lot to me, and Romney Care is basically Obamacare. It is. Um, so he gets it, and I like like we were talking about earlier. I like his family. It, he's just like good imaging, and he's obviously very handsome. Yeah, but I mean, don't you think he has had no political integrity in his views over his career? I don't really care about it. It's not my party. Oh, uh, so <laughs> he's just like a handsome guy that shows up for the big game when I needed him on and, impeachment and creates jobs. Sure, creates yeah. jobs at Bain or. The Olympics? On the state level, the Olympics. Um, but again, he's like that image that I like. You know, it, it's like a like a good representation, I think, of American values. M to me, he reads soulless corporate automaton. It's very interesting that we have different perceptions of him. Uh, it's not that shocking, is it? It is such I mean, shocking. you also asked me to pick a Republican, which is not that easy for Yeah, me. but I mean, I, I would think that there's, I mean, there's lots of Republicans and Democrats who I, I like a lot better than Well, Romney. I also liked like Bob Corker and Jeff Flake and those kinds of, I mean, all the rhinos, okay. I guess. Okay. <laughs> hey guys, Michael Malice here. I want to tell you about Beachbody. If you text 303030303030 to Malice, you text the word Malice to that number, you get full access to the entire platform for free. Totally free, totally free. What is Beachbody On Demand? It's a brand that's been around for a very long time. They're the company behind P90X, behind Insanity, behind 21 Day Fix. How it works is there's a bunch of trainers. You find someone who looks like you, what you want to look like, and you download their program and you do it. They have videos to show what the motions are. You can access it anywhere at any time. It's absolutely free. They have something if you want to be in a hotel. They have something if you're locked in your house and going crazy because of coronavirus, like some people I can mention. All you have to do, there, there's so much there, so much, so much, so much content. And now's a good time to get up your ass and get into shape as we face the apocalypse. And bodybuilding, yoga, cardio, weight training, dance workouts. If you text MALICE to 30, 30, 30, you get access to the full platform for free. Let's get back to the show. How much, do, so as someone who is, uh, an establishment Democrat. How disturbed were you? We don't like or, that. We're just Democrats. You said that. You said that yourself. No, I know. Earlier. But I was saying it was linked to a larger point that no, establishment no, is. You don't know where my question's going. Oh. I was going to say, how did you feel watching Jeremy Corbyn in Britain have that huge defeat? Because oh. he's not establishment. He's very much fringe. That's yeah. where I was going with this. Oh yeah, um, I felt great about it. Okay. So. Um, I used to live in London and I worked on Boris Johnson's mayoral re-election oh, wow. campaign okay. against Ken Livingston, who's part of the Jeremy Corbyn orbit. And the thing that defines them the most to me, besides 
radically stupid economic policy is that even as someone who's in favor of some degree of redistribution, I think it's just totally cracked, is that they're a big bunch of anti-Semites. And I'm Jewish, not particularly religious, and have been defense- I didn't know you were Jewish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Totally Jewish. Um, 100% Ashkenazi, in fact. I. Uh, it took a lot for me to go work for the conservative candidate yeah. in London. And this was bef- pre-Brexit stuff. I would not um, work for Boris now. I'm very anti-Brexit. But that our left was so supportive of their left really disturbed me because there is just this complete ignorance or putting blinders on or whatever is happening to the discriminatory policies that are actually part of the modern left. It's like 11 or 12 Jewish MPs from the Labor Party have resigned because of Jeremy Corbyn. And I know that it wasn't the key factor in him getting voted out at that level. People just wanted decisiveness about Brexit. And he should have just said, I'm a lever or a remainer instead of this, we'll work it out because people are just sick of it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but I was thrilled when he got like his ass handed to him at that level, that districts that had voted labor for 80 years, 90 years, whatever it is, just said, I can't. Yeah, this it, is too it terrible. was the biggest labor defeat since 1935. Yeah. And they the writing was on the wall. I don't understand how they didn't reshuffle this. And I went, um, so I go back to London three or four times a year. And I went to a lecture that David Miliband was speaking at, um, who his brother, Ed Miliband, had been the leader. Do, I don't know if you remember this, but there was course, yeah. a brotherly war, I would say. And now David Miliband lives here, in fact. Um, but every question that got asked after uh, after the lecture which had been about refugees he works at a, at a refugee organization was can you please come home and fix this I and mean, the desperation for good leadership is so palpable in britain and jeremy corbyn has left behind so many people especially the ones who are the most aware of how scary who he is a, as a person is. And then to see his open embrace by people here, like AOC, you know, has tweeted positively about when he heard deputy comms person. I think I had to delete a tweet or something about Jeremy Corbyn. That whole crew, um, Bernie has spoken favorably about him. And I don't buy that people are not aware of the anti-Semitism component of this because there just have been too many public resignation from the left from the left yeah this isn't righties like leveraging thing necessarily 100 percent, because i think that happens all the time sure of and, course you know, it does saying, yes. like, oh they're an anti-semite and like you know calm down, there's yeah. a calm down a little yeah. like that was maybe they misspoke or you're not understanding this or you're not giving the palestinians enough um in the way that you talk about what a two-state solution looks like but I, anyway so i was thrilled it's just uh, one of the things i always harp on on twitter is uh people on the right think the left is a monolith and people on the left yeah. think the right is a monolith. And I tell them, I go, are you saying that like you're a Trump person, it would be fair to say you're a Jeb person? Like, what are you talking? It makes no sense. No. But you're doing the same thing, you know, with the other side. And I think it's a function of two things. One is a lot of people are binary thinkers. It's us versus them. And two is, I think the media often likes to make things simpler than they are. Yeah. And they do want to present you know, Jeremy Corbyn as basically the same thing as Nancy Pelosi, which he is not at all. Right. But they have this bizarre perception or then it becomes, well, if you scratch her, she'll basically agree with him. And it's really not that case. Like there are huge divisions. Let me ask you this. Uh, There's this trope that the Bernie bros, Mm -hmm. right? Like the Bernie Sanders supporters are somehow disproportionately aggressive, misogynist, you know, hostile. I can't wrap my head around this because I think... Every follow, every person who has a big social media following are going to have jackasses in their right. following who are extremely aggressive. You, what you, you're gonna certainly have it with the Trump people. You you have it with the Hillary people. I, I don't. Can you explain this to me? Do you think this is true? This Bernie Bros thing. I do. Okay. And I've been victim okay, of it sure. um, as someone who since 2016 has been advocating for. I think to your point about Nancy versus Jeremy Corbyn, a more accurate portrayal of who the democratic party is you know saying like the justice democrats do not represent us they actually don't even win races i mean that's the hilarity of the whole thing is that the way the media portrays it you would think that super lefties are winning all of their races and not that 35 of the 41 seats we took were people in purple and red districts who have records that look more like Kristen cinema than they do anything like ilan omar 
Um, there, I believe that Bernie does not condone it or endorse it. And he has spoken out a few times about it more in this election than the last time around. I think that the experience of losing when he felt like he was close or it was possible that he could have won, I don't think that's true because he had no African-American support, um, has changed him a bit about it. But even going back to what we were talking about with the sexism thing with Elizabeth Warren and Bernie, you know, they came out with the snake, you know, the snake emoji turned into what they were sending to all of these Warren supporters. And they've been doing it since the South Carolina defeat. Um, for Bernie and the big win for Biden going into Super Tuesday, really hammering Warren people and Warren herself about how selfish she is, that she didn't get out of the race. I think dropout Warren was trending, yeah. Yeah. Multiple times it has. And like the Warren to Bernie and Warren to Biden are now, if you search those hashtags, it's fascinating what's going on here. First of all, it's a total misrepresentation of what's going on because her base is split. They're not naturally all Bernie yeah. folks. Half of them were Amy and Pete and Biden-like folks. And I think watching her on Matto, I, I don't know if you saw the interview, it a 99.9% bar sure that she's endorsing Joe Biden because she called him a kind and decent man. And she talked about the online bullying. And that's not good odds. I also think Joe is just on his way to the nomination so she'd look like a big idiot at yeah. this point if she said like i'm going with this guy and then you're on the losing side and she wants a great job and whatever in the next administration if we manage to win um but i do think the online bullying thing is real and there have been studies about it and there i the hillary base is just not like that i mean they'll get into a policy fight with you but they don't feel and i don't want to say as passionately because I, I think that we do feel very passionately about our causes and our ideological position, but there's a level of vitriol and aggression that comes from this blow up the system type people, right? So I don't even want to say they're bad people, but if you are wanting a revolution, that takes violent means, right? And today violent means are tweets, essentially, right? You're not, it's not like Robespierre style. We're going to show up and start beheading people. Um, so I think that's what's going on. And you can look at the tweets to see it. All right. Let me interrupt you for a second. Who is your one favorite Republican? Hands down, Tulsi Gabbard. Why is that? Um, she is the star of Fox News, obviously. So it's like hometown crowd. Actually, it's been really funny. The people who are kind of doing countdown clocks to when she's going to drop out are making the joke like as soon as her Fox contract shows up, <laughs> that's when she's actually going to get out of the race. I'm, I don't know. She's just doing Republicans bidding all the time from, you know, calling Hillary the queen of all warmongers, um, going after the DNC the way that she did in 2016. Um yeah, I think that she does more to help the Republican side than she certainly does to help the Democratic side. And to see the amount of cash flowing into her primary challenge in Hawaii is quite something. Well, I think. she's not running for re-election. Well, it, before she oh. dropped out, what's his name? Kie, I forgot his whole, or I am not going to pronounce his name properly. Uh, before that, if he was getting tons of dollars from out of state. She really inflames the Democratic side. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. I want to tell you about probably one of my favorite sponsors, with this, which is Sheath Underwear. If you go to sheathunderwear.com, use code MALICE20, you get 20% off. S-H-E-A-T-H underwear.com. What makes them great? Sheath Underwear comes with a dual pouch. So it makes your, you know what, feel like they're floating on clouds while you work out or just walk around somewhere hot. It's like an inverted kangaroo pouch that keeps your junk from sticking to your legs. It really... When I first got it, they sent it to us, and I was like, all right, what is this? And now I wear it every day. They're really comfortable, and they make you feel a little bit subversive. Not going to lie. They create amazing underwear. If you don't like them, and if you don't love them, they have a 100% money-back guarantee off your first pair. I wear them. Trust me. They're so fun. If you go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE20, 20% off. Take a look. They've got a ton of different styles. Uh, it's really kind of exciting. They're kind of boxer briefs. They also have regular briefs and they use moisture wicking technology that keeps everything breathable and incredibly comfortable. And it makes you look like you've been doing squats as I have. Let's get back to the show. So to be a, a left of center person on Fox, are your Twitter mentions like hell on earth? Yeah. Well, I don't have, I, I have not that many followers by Fox standards. I probably have like 35,000 on Twitter. I think 34,000 of them hate me. 
Wow. Like, I think it's all hate follows. It's just a sea of – I mean, people, what, I've inter- what I've noticed lately that I think is really funny is that people are clearly just not listening to what I'm saying. Like the Chuck Schumer thing this week, you know how he said Kavanaugh and oh, Gorsuch, yeah, yeah. like, we don't watch yourself. You'll pay the price. Immediately condone, uh, dismiss, did not condone it on TV. I was like, this is unacceptable. Words matter. You have crazy people like the pipe bomber, yeah. right? And and Steve's my Twitter, yeah. And my Twitter mentions were all like, I knew you would defend Schumer. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what's going on? Like Ed Henry was hosting the show and he's looking at his tweets because, you know, the hosts on, end up on it and all of it. And he's like, these people are, it does not matter what you say. Yeah. Like, unless there is a picture of me wearing a Keep America Great hat, which they would know was a joke anyway. Right. They won't pay any attention to it. Um, what I am heartened by is that I meet a lot of people outside of New York, because in New York, no one watches Fox, but all across the country who come up to me and tell me that they really like hearing my arguments and they feel like they're persuasive and they really appreciate the dynamic that exists. Because what's special about Fox versus the other cable networks um, is that the formula is that we're all a big family, right? It has this dysfunctional family thing going on, which was what Roger Ailes wanted. He was said, you know, people don't, they want clashes, but they also want to know that it's all okay. Yeah. And our personalities are known. Like someone like Kennedy, you obviously know what kind of personality she has, that we talk about personal details, that you know – that Harris has two daughters and that Melissa has three kids and that you know that Sean is really into his um, – I forget what kind of martial arts he does. But, like, these are things that get discussed in the sea of also talking about really tough political issues, which endears people to you because they say, like, oh, she's a human, right? She talks about – her breakup. She talks about her whatever it is. And that's why having the radio aspect and shows like Kennedy and, and Red Eye when it was on where we met originally, I think are so important to the formula and creating a, dynam- a dynamic at work where people who hate my politics, for instance, still like me. What do you think has been so far the worst aspect of the Trump presidency? The worst aspect of the Trump. I'm sure there's stuff you could laugh off or be like, okay, if this was another Republican, it would be the same. But there's some stuff where you're like, okay, this is this is new. The and Helsinki is- press conference with Putin, what, where he said uh, we were talking, and he said he didn't interfere in the election. I, and I, I, so uh, you don't think that? I think that was clearly a joke. No, no, it wasn't a joke. It what? Okay, here's how I perceive it. I thought it was very much a clear joke, but maybe I'm wrong. I've never even heard that. I've never even heard a Republican, not that I'm calling you a Republican, but defend it that way. I thought he was saying, this is how I perceived it, that he was like, uh, because he regards this whole uh, collusion as a hoax, right? Right. He says this repeatedly. And I don't think he thinks, he doesn't think Russia interfered. Correct. So then he goes, well, I just asked him. He said, it's fine. So problem solved. Like that's, no, I I didn't take it that way, okay. and a lot of Republicans didn't like Marco Ruby, you know, kind of neocons when they sure. when it suits them. Right, were horrified by it. So I actually did that hadn't even occurred to me that it was a joke because he's done that so many times. The kind of shifting, like, oh, why would he do it? And that's what the whole crowd strike theory is about pinning the interference on Ukraine right. versus Russia. So for me, whether it was a joke aside which I don't think it was, that was a real low point to me. All of the international embarrassment stuff gets to me as someone, and I know it's, you know, globalist, elitist, but because I lived in London for so long and so many of my friends are over there, the change in respect for our country, whether it's warranted or not, I know there are some good things that have happened. I'm, I'm happy that NATO countries are paying more than they did. They're, they can afford it, right? Yeah. Like it's not like you're going to the poorest of places and saying, give me everything that you've got. If you're telling Germany that has, you know, an amazing economy that's humming along, you should be paying half a percentage point more or whatever it is, that I'm totally fine with. But I don't – I liked even with the Bush administration, obviously with the Obamas, that world leaders were – excited to greet us and that we were part of this community that I think is working for a better future now that's not like we should intervene less and there are problems with it but that 
that does get to me. So from your perspective, you think Trump is less respected internationally than Bush? Yeah, I do think so. Um, I, well, I think Bush has taken a huge um, plot, like, in the plus direction in terms of yeah. his – everyone has, actually, yeah, in the Trump course. era. Like, looks better and better. So obviously – the Iraq stuff really hurt his image. But I just mean having part of having a first family that you feel represents your values and the country's values is something that I think is important. And I don't care if Trump and Melania sleep in the same room or or any of that. But there was a warmth and kind of just an excitement that people greeted Bush's and Obama's with. I can't. I hate Laura Bush, like on a, oh. <laughs> on a fundamental level. First of all, she killed someone, as you probably know. Um, I did not know that. Yeah, when she was in college, she ran over her friend and killed him. Yeah, and had no consequences for it. Uh, yeah, actually. Li- yeah, yeah, literally. So that's a great trivia question. Who's the only first lady who's killed someone? They joke about Hillary. No, no, it was Laura Bush. Um, uh, number one. Number two is she was uh, she was a librarian, which yeah. means books that are stolen from authors and given to the poor, and she, by via tax money, which is theft also. She was on Jay Leno. I'll never forget this. And Jay Leno, who is not exactly edgy, no. says, who would win in a fight, you or Teresa Hines Carey? <laughs> and she literally just stares at him. And to his credit, Jay Leno's like, I'm fucking sitting here all day, bitch. I'll wait it out. I'll fucking, this is my show. And she just goes, ha ha, very funny. And I'm like, you miserable scold. Just make a joke. Like, (laughs) it depends. Are we fighting in a tub of ketchup? I mean, something, anything. And I'm like, oh, you horrible woman. So I I hate her. Oh, I'll have to watch that clip. The thing is that you and I have discussed that people don't appreciate is Hillary Clinton is a lot funnier than people realize. She's not as funny as you think she is, but she's a lot funnier than than people realize. She's quick. And did you listen to her interview with Howard Stern that came out in December? No, I have not. So, well, you can also watch it. It's all, um, it's online. It is fucking hilarious. I mean, beyond the fact that he's so funny, um, you also don't know going into it that Howard Stern is a huge Hillary fangirl. And he starts out by talking about telling her that he fought so hard in 2016 to get her on his show. She, He thought, my viewers, my listeners are the ones that need to hear her with somebody like me. And Hillary's team blocked it. And it was so representative of what went wrong. Yeah, there was like the lack of press availability really screwed well, her. Totally. And once, I mean, I've only, I'm only through the first part of the Hulu documentary, but we've just gotten into the email stuff. And she's talking about how she really had no idea. She thought it was going to be a two day story. And then it turned into this onslaught and they got more defensive and more defensive because after she said, remember, like, oh, did I scrub my server like with a cloth or whatever, which is not an example of her being funny. Right. Um, They weren't prepared for what was going to happen. But I'm sitting there thinking, like, we lost by 77,000 votes. Howard Stern has how many listeners, right, in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And cred with his listeners. Totally. Like, he is not going to be advocating for someone who isn't the real deal. And... The interview is funny and light and also really serious. I would really recommend um, that your listeners listen to it. I think it'll give you a new perspective on her. And she's very good at explaining how complex all of the decisions that you have to make in those positions of power are. Like, however you feel about Benghazi or her decision to stay with her husband and all that. And I love that they're more open now talking about the Lewinsky scandal we should say the clinton affair um that's also great uh the clinton affair on a and e if you haven't seen it because it has about two and a half hours of interviews with monica Lewinsky, who is a wonderful tremendous human being it's unbelievable to think about what happened to her but but this was done to her by hillary and her goons well not just by hillary i mean it was but it was she was portrayed as a stalker that was the word used yes and that's oh bimbo eruptions was about someone else oh it was a real low point Okay. For sure. And I think that when you look at who is commenting in the documentary and in the Clinton affair, for instance, you see how pained people like Jen Palmieri, who has been in this orbit forever. Hillary's camp. Uh, uh, pre- deputy pre- press secretary. Yeah. Um, has been about this and what was done to an innocent, a, a complete innocent. Kid. Yeah, a kid. And so I don't know if we've talked about this before, but so my – Parents are both liberals, um, which is unsurprising. But my dad 
hates Bill Clinton with like the heat of a thousand suns. And I didn't really get it. And he has always said he both my parents are lawyers by trade. My dad was like, he deserved to be impeached. He lied under oath. That's it. Those are the rules. He was disbarred. It's a felony. It's yeah. a felony. And he said, you, you know, we can argue, should you, should Ken Starr have been like a dog with a bone about something like this? Yeah. No. Like, it was a blowjob. Sure. And you can argue that those are not grounds for impeachment. But he said, but the lying is, no one forced him to lie about it. And, you know, people are having affairs all over the place. I mean, look at the president we have now. If he had said, I made a huge mistake, I was unfaithful. Why would he I, say it was a mistake? He goes, I, I was unfaithful. I was proud of it. He wouldn't yeah. say it was a mistake. Well, he would yeah, because yeah. Hillary would sure. had his her, I, I her mean, kitten I mean, heel Trump, on his Trump, neck. Trump wouldn't say it was a mistake. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Stormy Daniels, yeah. no mistake. Maybe yeah. a campaign finance right. <laughs> violation mistake. Um, but my dad feels very strongly, and I've been coming around more to his view on this, that Hillary is the real – the real deal in that couple. She's not as charismatic. You know, she can't. She's not going to be the, quote, first black president, right? She doesn't play the sax. She doesn't, you know, um, I don't know if you caught Elijah Cummings' funeral, but Bill Clinton's eulogy was all extemporaneous. He had nothing written down. And it was, it wasn't Obama level who had written it down, but the guy yeah. obviously yeah. has skills that way. She's not the same in that sense. But my dad really feels like she was the one who deserved it more. He was like, she has worked harder. She has more plans. She's prepared for these things. And he feels like Bill Clinton held her back. And he said, and as a father of a daughter like you, who would have been a White House intern at yeah. 22 and would 100% have had that affair and felt the same way that Monica did, like you're madly in love, right? And he makes, I've met him a few times, he makes you feel like you are the only person in the room. And I was someone he wasn't having sex with. So I can't even imagine what it's like yeah. if you're also sleeping with him. Um, there are a lot more Democrats, I think, who feel that way now than there used to be. And Monica being out there with her anti-bullying campaigns and people in Hillary's orbit admitting that they made mistakes, I think, has significantly affected that that shift. Uh, I had Juanita Broderick on this show. She hates me. You talk about Twitter hate. She tweets at me once a quarter. And it is days of hell. I, I believe her. I uh, believe uh, Bill Clinton raped her. I'm not asking you to ha necessarily have an opinion, but this is why I believe her. Uh, and it's it's I'm going to in include Thatcher in here, my great hero, Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. When Margaret Thatcher did some interview, you could find this on YouTube, and she was talking about how basically she got kicked out of the prime minister's office overnight, like she didn't see it coming. And obviously, when you're PM for 10 and a half years, and this is your identity, this is, was a very yeah. traumatic situation. And she's describing it matter of factly, but she's crying. So there was this disconnect between the words and the eyes. It yeah. was very disturbing to see. And you knew this is coming from a place of pain, but at the same time, the trauma, you know, trauma gets relived throughout the years. And when I wanted to think that Juanita Broderick just fucked him and regretted it or something like that, right? right? And she did the same thing. She was matter of fact and she was, was crying, crying, but like the, the affect was very calm. And I'm like, oh shit, this is the same thing. So I totally believe her that Clinton uh, uh, um, uh, raped her. How do you grapple with that? Why does Juanita Broderick hate you? Juanita Broderick hates me, I think because of my affection for the Clintons just she, okay. generally. And I have said that he is deplorable, certainly in the way that he's treated women from Juanita Broderick to Jennifer Flat to all of them. And it shouldn't be that hard to not do things like that. I, I always find it funny that powerful men are so willing to risk their status in life. Well, that's the thrill. For I get it, but that's the thrill. If you think of the long term, if Bill Clinton's How do you know you're down, powerful unless you're testing your power? That's what it, that's how it works. But that's it can psychology. be a, I mean, there is a way to stop yourself before you are at best case scenario going to be entangled in a sexual encounter that someone could interpret as going you. badly. I agree with you. Um similar to what happened with Kobe Bryant and the woman in it was in Utah, right? I believe um, so, yes. And that's a whole other thing that I'm fascinated by that we cannot talk about the fact that Kobe Bryant is credibly accused of raping a woman. I mean, when he died, it was like... Well, I wouldn't say it was his karma, Jessica, like you're implying. No. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> we, all I am heard, not we all heard the clip. <laughs> oh, my God. I really don't mean that. And I no, love I know Kobe. you don't mean that. I'm, I'm just joking, yeah. just to be clear. No, because no. actually, I do have to explain that I'm just joking because Ari Shafir just had that joke about Kobe dying and oh, he, got, he lost his agent and everything. Yeah, forever. I was like, holy crap. I didn't... 
I heard what he said. I did not like it. And I don't think it's obviously akin to what I'm saying, That's which not, is yes, we have to course. be doing yeah, good yeah. journalism. Yeah, yeah. And this is part of their lives, right? I mean, Bill Clinton's obituary, when I hope it doesn't come out for a very long time, is going to have to include all of this. And like the real reckoning that, frankly, his actions almost alone have caused for the Democratic Party, who can't run around now saying, we believe women, but not that woman. Or not this woman. And with Juanita Broderick, it's really tough because there were a bunch of articles. This originally started, I think, on Hannity. So Hannity's close with her. And she's appeared on his show a few times. And there was an article, I think it was in the LA Times that I referenced, that had talked about how she wasn't a credible witness. Okay. And that Ken Starr had declined to use her. Interesting. I did not know this. Yeah. Just. And I brought that up. And I said, I'm not here to litigate what happened in a dark room in Arkansas in It was it was bright. It was the morning. That's okay. what was disturbing to me. I I personally don't love morning activity. Yeah. Consensual or not. Yeah. So yeah, sure. It's just too bright and then you can like see everything and it's kind of gross. Anyway I um, prefer to rape in the dark. <laughs> yeah. Um but I referenced how Star didn't use her. And you would think that he would, right? I mean he had used everybody. And it started like a hell on Twitter. And then there were a couple other times where one time she went after my voice, which is a very common thing that Fox viewers do. But it was just – I felt like – and I didn't respond to any of it. One of them I think I have responded to, but like Julie Roginsky, who you know as well, came to my defense about it. It was like in this – this is a contest of ideas now at this point. And if you – have an issue with her voice or her appearance that's not the way to go after this you know represent yourself of what you yeah. think differently than this and she's just i mean she's a huge trump supporter now yes. so who is not going to be interested in my politics um but i really did think that debate where trump brought all of the clinton accusers and sat them in the front row was one of the low points in modern american political history and that hillary had to for whatever role she played in this can you imagine having to get through a three-hour debate with donald trump staring at jennifer flowers and Juanita Broderick? i mean it's just it's a joke uh you know trump's gonna bring out biden's grandkid right with the strip yeah but i i made the joke on kennedy and i I will bring it up again that we should just lean into being pro life, right? That we're like, <laughs> we went ahead <laughs> and had this baby. It's good, right? Who's going to be, prediction time, <gasps> who's going to be the next Supreme Court vacancy? I mean, RBG or Breyer. I think it's Breyer. Everyone forgets about him. And that's the twist. And he's had cancer too. That's the shock twist no one sees coming. Well, it's someone. Uh, it, it could was, be Thomas. I doubt it. If Trump's reelected? You think? It could be. I'm saying it could be. That's you the think, outside shot. Those are the three. That's Yeah. I really only look at our side. Okay. I mean, I think, you know, like I said, I I believe Trump will win. And the fact that then we're staring down the barrel of a 7-2 majority because they yeah. just they can't make it four more years. That's just too much to ask. And I think something that liberals do really badly is unify around issues like that. I mean, the way that the right came to Kavanaugh's defense and turned out, you know, you can use – judges as a turnout issue you can use guns as a turnout issue you can use abortion as a turnout issue nothing works like that with democrats like we're also split in what is most important to us um that it's it's much more difficult to Hmm. mobilize but this what's going on right now around joe biden is giving me a little bit of hope that people get how serious this is because i know that 50 percent of biden supporters wish it was someone else oh yeah right like they wish hillary were back they wish obama you know an obama type person no one wants a 77 year old 78 year old right like at least someone in their 50s um but it's interesting because we are if this works knock on wood we will have accomplished what republicans couldn't against trump right that doesn't mean we win necessarily but at least we're looking at the writing on the wall saying we got to do something if this is who we think is going to have the best shot against him uh, we're running out of time. Oh. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Definitely explaining how late-term abortion works. Uh, no, just kidding. That was not fun because it's just complicated and gross. Um, what was the favorite part? I mean, just being here, generally, it's so nice. Um, I think 
maybe talking about Jeremy Corbyn and like what's going on there. I feel like that's a really under amplified yeah. story and the people are just like, oh, it's a bunch of leftists, but this is a particular strain of leftism. Um, and it was really nice to hear that my colleagues at Fox like me. So thank you for sharing that publicly. You are welcome. 